Am I on? I think so. Bonjour. Thank you so much for coming to my talk. I'm going to be soon talking to you about coming to JavaScript from a more, there we go, now I'm on, from a strongly and statically typed programming language like Java, C Sharp, C++. Uh, I've just tweeted my slides, so in case you are staring at your computers up in the balcony, please feel free to take a look at .js, the uh, Twitter handle, and I just tweeted it at the hashtag if you want to follow along with me. So. So I'd like to talk to you a little bit about coming to JavaScript from another programming language. JavaScript right now has an influx of people from more strongly and statically typed programming languages, like Java, C Sharp, and things like that. And there's always a concern about JavaScript is the Wild West. JavaScript doesn't have the single compiler, a single tool that gives me confidence and security that my code at least meets some minimum level of standard. JavaScript doesn't have one tool like that. JavaScript has the ability to not necessarily consider all of your structural types, all of the code actually passing syntax validation and things like that, when you want to run this in the browser and in, in Node, for example. And this is actually somewhat of a benefit. We can write JavaScript very quickly without the mental overhead of thinking all of these things true, thinking all of these things through. But it is incorrect that, that we don't have, it is, it is true that we don't have one tool, like a single compiler that handles all of these different concerns to give us confidence in our code. But rather, we have many different tools. We have many layers that we can build into our application to build up a defense against bad code. We don't have one compiler, but we have many, many different static analysis tools that we can put into our repertoire and build into our development processes and production deployment processes to keep us from making stupid mistakes that we actually end up getting to production. So, quick question, quick poll for all of you. How many of you, because of an emergency code problem in production, maybe the credit card system stopped working, or maybe you can't get the items into your shopping cart, have just like committed code and actually pushed this to production? Okay, thank you all for not lying to me. I was a little bit concerned that I'd be the only one. So, good job. So this is something that I do not very often, but it's definitely happened in my life, that I have I've made a change very quickly. I thought this was completely fine, and I pushed this to production. As a human being, it's very difficult to read, for example, code samples like this. This is an example of two pieces of code. One is just an example from Backbone, just some Backbone view code. One is an example basically out of the Node.js documentation. As a human being, I look at these two pieces of code, I think, I fixed my error. I'm sure that in production my shopping cart will work and we can make some money as a business. But actually, subtly, there are two distinct problems here. One is I forgot a curly brace there. One is that I actually have an extra paren right here. But with our human eyes, it's, it's very difficult to find something like that. This is something that on our, on our road to approximate all of the confidence that a compiler can give us, this is one of the different pieces and layers of tooling that we can have in our deployment process. It would be great if we actually had tools that said at the time at which we tried to commit this or submit this to um, our continuous integration system, that it would tell us on line number five, you have an issue, there's, there's a problem there, you didn't actually type something correctly, even though you think it's ready for production. And uh, additionally, on line number eight, there was another problem. So the, the ways that you can do this, there are sundry different tools that can analyze and statically and, and syntactically validate your code. Uh, the, the first two here are Esprima and Grunt.js validate. Es Esprima is a, a JavaScript parser written by Aria Hedayat, as well as the second tool. Both are written by him. You should take a look at it. If you're interested in the static analysis tools, definitely follow him on Twitter and read every single blog post. Aria Hedayat made the first two things here. The second one is a Grunt plugin. If you happen to be using Grunt, I don't know if, I don't think Eddie actually asked this. How many of you are using Grunt? You are. Cool, great. So there is a huge Grunt ecosystem of amazing tools that you can build into your development as well as production deployment processes that take care of a lot of these things. And also, if you happen to be working for a Java shop and currently using the Google Closure Toolkit, the Google Clo Closure Compiler and Ecosystem have some great tools for syntax validation like this. Again, this is just one of the many layers that you can add in to approximate the kind of confidence of a full regular compiler like Java or C Sharp. But of all of the things I could possibly show you, syntax validation, this is kind of boring, right? Like, the, your IDE can do this. Even my lowly Vim that doesn't have any of the fancy things that Eclipse or IntelliJ happen to have, 
My Vim can give me, because of syntax highlighting, that there are problems like this. But this is just one of the many kinds of stupid mistakes that we can make as developers. And even though we would like to think that we never actually do this when we push to production, it can happen. And adding this into some enforced process in your team and in your organization can really help with decreasing the kinds of problems that actually ever hit production. So the next layer up, there's another layer on top of this that you can use to help uh, stop very common errors, and that is linting. Linting is a process that analyzes your code for common semantic errors, not actual syntax problems, but common semantic errors, as well as can enforce across your team some code style problem, or code style adherence to make sure that you all follow roughly the same kinds of ways of developing. Uh, for example, here, if you see on line number three, I'm actually defining a conditional with an assignment expression inside. This is actually valid JavaScript, although it's probably a mistake. Most people don't intend to write something like this. Maybe if you come from a different programming language like C++ or C, this happens to be a common idiom. But inside JavaScript, it's a very not common idiom, and it's probably a mistake. This is proper valid syntax, so the previous tool, like a syntax checker, would not actually stop you from committing this and deploying this to production. But a tool like a linter would give you very nice error messages like this to tell you on line number three, it expected a conditional, but it actually saw an assignment inside. Additionally, more than just common semantic problems like, the, uh, like having an assignment expression inside of your conditional, a linting tool has sundry different options that you can control and standardize across your team for requirements that you want your code to adhere to. For example, you can, show, you can make sure that every function is defined in strict mode. Uh, so another quick poll just because I want to know. How many of you use strict on your code in JavaScript? Awesome, great. I hope all of you raise your hand next year if I, this question happens to be asked again. Strict mode is a great thing to do. It, it stops a lot of the uh, potential uh, foot guns of JavaScript. It opts you into a much stricter and better mode to write your code in. Uh, additionally, if you happen to be of the persuasion that loves semicolons, you can add an enforced rule in your linting process that you have to use semicolons at the end of every line. And at the time at which you run this tool, it'll warn you saying on line number four, you forgot to use a semicolon. Definitely do that before you actually um, deploy your code. So at the time at which you're actually trying to do add linting into your build process, I want to encourage all of you to go home after this, go back to your workplaces and decide, we are now gonna add these kinds of tools into our build process and able to be able to have everyone run these kinds of validations at the time at which they're actually developing. When you start to do this and when you start to integrate this into your work process, you go to, for example, the JSHint is the tool that does this. You go to the JSHint documentation, you look at the options, there are 75 to 100 different options. There's always the concern of option paralysis. We look at that list and we say, uh-oh, I don't really want to think about all of this. This is a lot of different decisions to make. I want to encourage you to not concern yourself with that. The first day when you actually decide to do this, you go through, select the default options that, the, that, the, uh, that JS Hint gives you, Choose those default options, make your code conform to those default options, and then a week later or two weeks later when you've actually spread this out to everyone, someone will complain to you saying, I hate semicolons, we can't do this anymore. And then, only then, go back and think about all of the different options that you might want to enforce for your team. In the beginning, go with the defaults and actually push this through. It'll make your lives and your team lives a lot better. So in addition, on top of linting, there are some great tools that give you historical maintainability information about your project. This, is the, this tool is something called Play-Doh. Play-Doh is, uh, is a tool that runs over your JavaScript. I happen to have it run every time that I commit and deploy to production. It runs over your JavaScript, spits out some configuration, some, some data files, some JSON files that have lots of heuristics about your application and on the code, the code base itself. These heuristics are very complicated equations come up by Microsoft and CMU and very, very smart people that give indication as to maintainability, estimated number of bugs, estimated difficulty of, the, of someone else coming to look at your code and reading it. Play-Doh is a tool that gives you this really nice UI on top of that. This is an example of the jQuery source code from approximately um, August of last year to February of this year. You can see a big dip right here. That's when jQuery exactly removed the support for IE 6, 7, and 8 from their master branch. You can go through and see things like average maintainability, uh, each, the number of potential errors per file, and then in each individual file, you can see that every, um, 
Every one of these files have lots of individual pieces of information, and for each function, you can get information about its cyclomatic complexity and potential difficulty to understand from a new developer perspective. The great part about this is not that it is a one-time thing. The great part is that over the course of time, with your team, you can say, over the past three months, it seems like our maintainability has gone way up, or our estimated number of errors has gone way down. What can we keep doing to do something like that? In the aggregate, this historical data is invaluable, and in the end, it's only a, a, about a single line of bash code that you add in to whatever continuous integration tool you're using to deploy every single time. Okay, so now we're at the next layer of static analysis tool that is near and dear to my heart. So, beautification. So I am someone who is very annoyed and, and frustrated every time I have a code review comment and someone else complains to me that I have two spaces accidentally instead of four, or three spaces accidentally instead of two. This is a complete waste of time to me when I can have a computer do everything for me. So, the, I, I like writing code sometimes that is the 19 statements on one line. I don't actually want anyone else to necessarily read this. I want an automated tool that will make everything conform to the standards that my team and organization has agreed to in a way that doesn't require our thinking or our mental process in reading through code reviews. That's not what code reviews are for. Beautification is a process by which you use a tool to convert the top part into the bottom part, very nice and very ugly at the top and very beautiful at the bottom. There are a few tools for this. If you happen to be working on a mixed team with a job with a, a Vim, IntelliJ, a Visual Studio, many different IDEs, you can use something like editor config. If you happen to be in a, in a place where you don't actually have any of those standards yet, Code Painter is a great tool because it can actually analyze your current code, look through and say, 90% of the time you use two spaces and you use almond style braces. So I will write a config file and force all of your code to conform to what you do normally 90% of the time. Uh, additionally, if you're trying out features of the next version of JavaScript, ES6, there are syntactic changes that can be handled by ES formatter. There are many other tools as well. So I've given you these, these great interesting tools, these layers to build in the approximation for the kind of confidence and security that a compiler uh, from Java or C Sharp give you, but how do you actually know that your developers are using it? It's very easy to say, we have these tools available to you. Just run grunt test or grunt build or grunt verify. But without actually having a way to enforce this, it's hard to make sure that code like this, the, the, the code that is quote unquote bad, actually does not make it to production and potentially does not even make it to your source control system. And the way that you do that is by using something called pre-commit hooks. Every version control system has something that is equivalent, SVN, Git, Mercurial. I happen to be using Git, so I'm talking about Git pre-commit hooks. This is basically just a bash script that will run every time you try to commit, and if that bash script has an error, it will not actually let you commit. This is an example. Let's say that I, I really don't like the code base I'm working on. I want to remove the semicolons because I hate that rule. I want everyone to only use semicolons if they're necessary. I try to add that back to my index, and then I try to commit because that I hate semicolons. What happens is, don't you hate semicolons? No? Um, what happens is I run through all of my, uh, my build process, I mean, my, my uh, pre-commit hook. After I've run through my pre-commit hook, it runs through the validation process, the hinting process, but then JS hint actually fails, grunt errors out, and my git pre-commit hook will not allow me to actually commit. This is great. This is much, much before something like this actually even hits the code base, even hits production. Again, we can go through and do something else. We can put back the semicolon. Now I want ugly code. I don't like these, this spacing formatting. Remove this, this spacing. Add this code again back to my index. And I try to commit. And again, I get an error message saying, my beautification process failed. You didn't actually match all of the syntax requirements that we have on this team. So again, you can't commit. This is fairly easy to add into your, into your development workflow. And there, it's also another easy commit to automatically format everything for you so you don't have to actually do the work uh, in, your, in, in your editor or anything like that. Additionally, when you, so when you go through, I, I'm completely foiled, I can't get through my beautification changes or my removing of semicolons. Now if I go through and just change some copy, and now this should be a valid commit, what I do is actually run through all of the previous tools that I, that I specified, as well as actually run all of my tests in order to make sure that and now when, when all of the tests are actually passed, only then does this commit actually go through. 
This is, if my rule is, as long as everything fits in under three to five seconds approximately, it's completely fine to throw it all into the pre-commit hook. If things get a little bit longer than that, you should definitely take it out, move it to your continuous integration system, and not require every developer to go through that every single time they commit. It's definitely a decision you all make individually for your teams. So, okay, so I have been dangling a carrot in front of your nose this whole time. And that's only partially because I wanted to show my one obligatory GIF and two obligatory cat of the presentation. I've been talking about types and statically typed programming languages and strongly typed programming languages and how it's so different coming from JavaScript because there is no single one tool that accomplishes all of these goals and more. But actually, and I promise this is the only French, last French I will use throughout the entire presentation, you can have your cake and eat it too. There is another language called TypeScript. TypeScript is a programming language on top of JavaScript, similar to CoffeeScript. It compiles from, JavaScript, from, from TypeScript down to the equivalent of JavaScript. It allows you to specify, using type annotations, a whole range of options that are very similar to what a Java or C Sharp provide for you in terms of, of actually enforcing types. This is an example of a function that I define that looks very, very similar to the equivalent to JavaScript, except I specify explicitly that the, num that the two parameters to this function have to be numbers. In this case, when I call on line number five, I call add A with string and B string. It gives me an error, an error message that potentially you feel more comfortable with, depending on what your background of programming language is. It tells you, no, you can't actually use this function because you defined it using numbers and you are trying to pass strings. TypeScript is a single tool, it's a command line executable tool for both, syntax, for both syntax validation and most of linting that I discussed earlier. It allows for compile time structural type validation. And for me, one of the biggest wins of this and what sets, this up, what sets TypeScript apart from CoffeeScript is that it is a strict superset of JavaScript. What this means is that any JavaScript that you find on a 2010 Stack Overflow post that you want to copy and paste how to use Fibonacci or something like that, it will completely work all of these new additional features are additive and completely optional. So you are free to use whichever, whatever features of TypeScript you want and leave aside the ones that you don't want. Any currently valid JavaScript is completely valid TypeScript, potentially with a few warnings that you didn't have types where you, need to, where you might want them to be. It's also significantly inspired by ES6, the next version of JavaScript. TypeScript, for example, stole class syntax. I say stole, not completely badly at all. Borrowed types, uh, class syntax and fat arrow and a few other things as well. And the greatest thing in terms of the win for the actual development process is IntelliSense. If you're coming from a Java or C Sharp, looking at what your, the tooling for JavaScript can do compared to the tooling for those kinds of languages is amazing to see how IntelliSense actually works. So here is an example of the TypeScript playground. So this is the uh, HTML editor tool, or it's in the browser editing tool that is inspired by a lot of IDEs that show a lot of the power and flexibility of TypeScript. You can find it online. This is an example on the left side is all of the TypeScript that comes in. On the right side is all of the JavaScript that gets spit out. Here's just an example that this is just regular JavaScript. It shows you some extra information, but you can use regular JavaScript with no type annotations. If I define an, an array of animals that all have the same properties in them, TypeScript and the TypeScript tooling, because it has all of this information about types present in it that flows throughout the entire ecosystem of tools, it actually gives you this amazing IntelliSense that says, I know that Rover, in this example, has a property legs and name. So in my editing tooling and in my experience, I can show you those as an example and you can actually choose from them. And it'll also give you the other way. If I try to use a property that doesn't actually exist, the TypeScript tooling, because it has all this information, can tell me that there is an error here. It doesn't actually exist. This is something that is caught way before you actually even try to commit this. Your tooling itself, while you are creating this code, brings up all of these problems. Additionally, you can define interfaces. Those interfaces can have forced properties and names, uh, names of properties that you have to define and their types. Because of all of this tooling, even very deeply nested inside of functions, right here I'm two levels deep inside of a function that sums up the number of legs in my animal, I again get uh, IntelliSense, because even deeply, because of this definition of an interface in TypeScript, all of that type information is kept throughout the entire editing experience of your program. IntelliSense is awesome. You should definitely try it out if you haven't experienced it before, if you haven't been in another programming language like Java or C Sharp. It is very, very cool to watch. I'm a Vim user, so predominantly I use autocomplete, but it, it's very, very cool. 
Okay, so TypeScript might be for you depending on the background of the team that you have put together. If, it is definitely very, very dis different from developing in JavaScript because the traditional JavaScript developer, and especially me, are, we're not used to thinking about all of the data types and property names and all of these things that flow through our application. Using TypeScript to its fullest does require a very different way of thinking compared to the usual way of developing JavaScript. It's definitely a decision that you and your team should make as to what kind of enforcement you want to have and what you want to teach the people on your team. I would love to hear your stories, good or bad, sometime in the future. So what I want you to do going away from here right now, I want you to go back to work, I want you to add validation and linting to your code base. I want you to be like a Nike developer. I want you to just do it. Don't think about anything else. Just go back and do it. No one's going to complain. If it, it'll all work well. Complain to me otherwise. Then the next thing I want you to do is after you add these two things, I want you to add a pre-commit hook to all of the code. This is the way you get the kind of enforcement that, fee, that you could, where you can feel the security and confidence that has to be with every single piece of code that ever makes it to your production system. So I have some resources here, how you can add a pre-commit hook, your JS hint options. There's a lot of other things in here. I'm really sorry, by the way, I lied earlier about no more French. Merci beaucoup.